very much for uh, an extremely, uh, excessively generous uh, introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be in this city, and I'm very pleased to be here, uh, and to be uh, connected with the Devarajar Center, uh, because he, uh, some of him was very kind to me, I knew him very well, met him many times, and uh, I think uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll try to explain why I think he is important, and uh, not just to Karnataka, Mysore, uh, but also to India uh, in, in his achievements. Um, I'll also try to explain why I think Mysore, where he grew to manhood, uh, is an important place, and not just for Karnataka, but for India as well. He was chief minister of this state for eight years in the 1970s. And he was the most constructive political leader this state has ever had, the most innovative and imaginative leader this state has ever had. And I should say that this state has had many constructive leaders. So uh, to be the most constructive is something special in a state that specializes in that. Uh, the uh, state of uh, before independence, some of you know this and some of you probably don't, so I'll, I'll presume, I'll speak to those who know this next to nothing. Um, before independence, one third of uh, India was ruled uh, by Indian princes, two thirds was directly ruled by uh, the British. And the, uh, the, the second largest of the 500 plus princely states in India was Mysore. And it was the largest was Hyderabad next door. Uh, and Mysore was the most uh, progressive of the states in, uh, in princely India. Uh, it, it, in, in Mysore state, an elected representative assembly was created by the Maharaja uh, long before a serious uh, representative elected institutions were created by the British in British India. Uh, in Mysore state, the press was free, diverse opinions could be expressed, and that was not always true in other princely states. In fact, many of them were nasty autocracies. Uh, in, in Mysore state, before independence, the courts worked well, the universities and administration worked well, and the Maharaja's government uh, took, step, took steps to open, open government up to diverse social groups uh, disadvantaged social groups as early as the 1920s. In this uh, liberal state, in this liberal atmosphere, progressive ideas flourished uh, in important institutions, not least Maharaja's College, about which I will talk in a moment, uh, where Devarajaras was a student. The Maharaja's College then uh, became part of the University of Mysore, as many of you know. Uh, Forward looking people held influential posts in that college. And in the city, we also found that there were uh, small but important non-governmental institutions that were also created a uh, space for discussion of progressive ideas. There's a place in Mysore today called the Gita Book House, which you might have walked past or even entered. That place was a center, as Professor Natraj has explained to me, uh, it was a center for discussion and, and for progressive books uh, for students at the University of Mysore at Maharaja's College and helped to facilitate the progressive atmosphere that existed uh, in the state and in the city. Uh, even the princely government even tolerated nationalist institutions during the freedom struggle. There was a Mysore State Congress, for example, in, in most most other Indian princely states, Congress organizations were banned, and sometimes they were brutalized by nasty princes. Um, in Mysore, they were tolerated until they directly challenged princely authority in Mysore. Uh, and when they did, they were treated leniently by this enlightened princely government. Uh, 
I remember talking to one old freedom fighter who, as a student <coughs> at Maharaja's College in 1942, had taken part in the Quit India movement. There was a big explosion of civil disobedience in Mysore, uh, at, out of the college and out of the city. And he and some of his fellow protesters were arrested and taken off to uh, a, a district not far away which, to what was described as a jail. But when they got there, they realized it wasn't really a jail because it, it was a kind of enclosure. But the gates were not locked. There were no guards to keep them in. So they just walked out, walked back to Mysore. It took a long time. They got back to Mysore and started to protest again. This was the kind of uh, treatment that this enlightened princely government uh, handed out. Sympathy with Indian nationalism extended even to the Mysore Palace. Um, you may know that the Maharaja of Mysore in the 30s once welcomed Gandhi to Nandi Hills as a state guest uh, after a particularly difficult uh, struggle that Gandhi had uh, been through. Um, the British didn't like that, and the Viceroy of India uh, took the got hold of the Diwan, that is the principal administrator of princely Mysore, and took him aside for a cup of tea and said, look, uh, I hear you've had Gandhi as a state guest. This is, this is not a great idea. And his words in, in the files of the British government, his words were, don't do it again, old chap. But that's, that's as bad as it got because the Viceroy knew this was a model state and he wouldn't intrude to mess things around. This was the environment state, this city, this college, this was the environment um, that Devarajars grew up in. Generations of outstanding enlightened figures in public life and the arts uh, studied at the at Maharaja's College in Mysore, where he studied. In the generation before him, there was R.K. Narayan, uh, the first great Indian novelist in English, who lived just down the street from the college. There was the great Kannada poet, Kuvim, who uh, taught a very progressive view, as a follower of Ram Manohar Lohia, who had very progressive views and became first a student, then a teacher, and eventually the principal of Maharaja's College. Uh, he was a young lecturer at the college when David Harris was a student. In the same generation as David Rajars was uh, M. N. Srinivas, who became India's greatest sociologist. Uh, he and David Rogers were students at the college at the same time. I, I never got, I, did, I didn't know that when the two of them were alive, so I never was able to ask them if they met, but it's very likely because it was not a huge institution. After David Rogers' time, the college had students like A.K. Ramanujan, a, a hugely distinguished poet, translator, and scholar. Uh, it had Abdul Nazir Saab, uh, political leader of progressive vision, and in my view, a leader of greatness. And I won't say that about very many Indian politicians. Abdul Nazir Saab created the, uh, uh, the state's pioneering Panchayati Raj program uh, as a minister. Maharaja's college produced Justice Venkata Chalaya, whose name is uh, much appreciated in, in high, high circles in Delhi. It produced UK Anantamurti, U R Anantamurti, uh, another great novelist who lived in Mysore after he taught at the college. This was the kind of institution that bred the progressive vision of Devaraj Harris. Uh, he absorbed ideas in the college and the city, and he also absorbed a, an enthusiasm for the freedom struggle when he was a student. And he joined the Mysore State Congress. Uh, which uh, was, was agitating for democracy within the princely state. The, the, there was no hope of democracy in the princely state. The British would never have permitted it. But they were agitating for this. And now, it's, uh, it may seem logical that a student uh, in those days would join the Congress struggle, but it, in his case, it's, it, it's, it's a little bit remarkable because De Rogers was a member of, this, of the extended uh, jati, or caste, of the Maharajas of Mysore. And for him to join the challenge to princely authority was something remarkable, and it meant that he was not very popular in the Mysore palace for quite some time. 
uh, after independence, he established what I think is still a record for the number of consecutive years in the state assembly, uh, first elected in, uh, in, from Hunsur, not very far from here, in 1952. And he carried on much longer than most other MLAs. He headed a number of ministries, and yet none of those ministries were important enough to, uh, well, they were not as important as they should have been, given his experience and his intelligence. He was blocked from, from important ministries because in those days, before 1972, uh, the two landed caste clusters of Karnataka, Lingayats and Wakaligans, dominated uh, state politics and dominated the important positions in state cabinets. <clears throat> Lingayats and Wakaligans owned uh, a great deal of the land in the villages and a great deal of the best land. They used this dominance and their numerical strength to dominate village life. And then they translated their dominance on the land to a similar dominance in state politics. This was common across uh, most Indian states in, from about 1954 or 5 until the 1970s. Uh, Edward Trust was, a, in a sense, a frustrated politician because in that Congress he was never given top jobs. And then in 1970, Mrs. Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, split the Congress party. And the ver the, there, were two, there were then two versions of the Congress party. And the version which opposed Mrs. Gandhi was the version that stayed in power in Karnataka. Um, it kept most of its links to Lingayats and Wokaligas on the land intact. And very few prominent leaders in this state joined Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, so she was. Uh, she looked around and found in Deva Rajaris a leader that she thought could uh, make, the, make the political party that she was leading prosper here. But he was starting from scratch. He had very few people with him when he, back to Mrs. Gandhi, he once told me that when he became president of the Congress, uh, the, uh, he, uh, took, uh, he, he had little more than the board outside the party office saying, this is Indira Gandhi's Congress party. He didn't have people supporting him, and he didn't have an organization. And the Lok Sabha election in 1971 came very early, uh, far too early for him to build an organization. Uh, and so on top of that, he was not given much money by Mrs. Gandhi and the, her Congress leadership in New Delhi. He described it <coughs> privately to a friend of mine and to me as stingy. So he was quite worried about that election, but Mrs. Gandhi's promise to abolish poverty Garibi Hatao, struck a chord with the state's voters, and to the astonishment of everybody, uh, her version of the Congress, the version that Deva Rajars led, won all 28 Lok Sabha seats in Karnataka in 1971, with 70% of the vote. Now, you have to understand what 70% of the vote is a, is a kind of a huge uh, majority. Uh, the Congress, Indian National Congress, you know, has won many, many Lok Sabha elections since 1952, and yet it has never achieved, it has never received 50% of the vote. It's always been less than 50%. Today, the BJP has a majority in the Lok Sabha on the basis of a 31% vote total. In 1971, uh, Mrs. Gandhi's Congress, led by ours, received 70% of the votes. This is a at the next state election, the next year, uh, again, David Rogers had no time to build an organization. He had to rely on popular enthusiasm for Mrs. Gandhi's promises, but that was enough. And her version of the party, which he led, won a big majority, 162 out of 224 seats in the state assembly. David Rogers became chief minister. Uh, the first chief minister of this state who was neither a Lingayat nor a Wakalika. No, he, was not, he was the first one not from the two groups that had dominated state politics since independence. Now, most of the other state level leaders in Mrs. Gandhi's Congress, uh, including Mrs. Gandhi, uh, thought very complacently that her progressive slogans were enough to keep them in power for many years. 
um, they were mistaken. David Rogers was much more realistic than these other chief ministers in Mrs. Gandhi's party. He was better at analyzing politics than most other politicians in that era or any other era. And he knew that he would face tough challenges from the guys and Wakaligas uh, who would want him removed as chief minister so they could resume their dominance of politics. He also uh, understood two important things that others in, the, in, the, in Mrs. Gandhi's party across India overlooked. First, he knew that he needed a strong party organization to give him firm connections to disadvantaged voters uh, who had uh, great numerical strength but were not well organized. The disadvantaged voters in Karnataka outnumbered the Lingayats and Wakaligas about two to one. Lingayats and Wakaligas together make up 32% of the population. But the, the rest uh, outnumbered them. Uh, and if he could mobilize the rest, he could stay in power. Mrs. Gandhi didn't, didn't like strong party organizations. She liked weak, she, she, she weakened, systematically weakened her own party's organization, which is a slightly crazy thing to do, uh, because she wanted to exercise personal rule within the party and within the country, and later dynastic. David Rogers understood that was not a great idea. He wanted to, he set out building an organization. The second thing he did, was that he knew that unless concrete action was taken to fulfill the progressive promises Mrs. Gandhi had made to consolidate the support of disadvantaged groups, that they would turn away. He knew that they were wide awake politically now. They would, he would not have been elected if they had not been wide awake politically. And uh, he knew that uh, the aware, their political awareness, which carried him to power in 1972, could turn sour if the promises were not fulfilled. So he had to take action. Some of the other chief ministers in India under Mrs. Gandhi did little or nothing to follow up on her progressive promises. For example, in West Bengal, the chief minister Siddhartha Shankar Roy of the Congress told his civil servants uh, that uh, tomorrow I will announce, and you must also announce, across the districts of Karnataka, uh, of West Bengal, that we have now completed our land reform program. Now, no land reform had taken place in West Bengal, uh, but they announced the completion of the, of the uh, program. This kind of lying and fiction uh, was a feature of Siddhartha Shankar Roy's leadership. In Bihar, in uh, the 1970s, when David Rogers was uh, introducing major changes to help poorer groups in Karnataka, the Congress Chief Minister Jagannath Mishra was giving guns to landlords to terrorize the same poor people that David Rogers was helping here. So uh, Mrs. Gandhi's uh, Congress was not consistently progressive across India, but it was certainly progressive in Karnataka. After uh, the 1972 elections, as has been mentioned, Mr. Uh, David Rogers introduced meaningful land reforms, meaningful in the sense that they actually had an effect on the ground they were just not on paper, as in many other Congress rural states. He introduced reservations for backward castes, backward classes, and these two uh, actions helped to build his, solidify, cement his support amongst disadvantaged groups. Um, he needed that to resist the inevitable efforts of Lingayat and Wakalika politicians to recapture power and dominate state politics. Um, he also understood those two groups, the guys who were calling us quite well. And he knew that although they were, they were dominant in the villages, they owned most of the good land, he knew that many Lingayats, and especially many Wakaligas, uh, were themselves poor. They were themselves disadvantaged. So he knew that poorer members of these dominant groups would benefit from his progressive programs, redistributed uh, programs, so that uh, they would also benefit uh, and they would also give him their votes. So he cleverly, and then he cleverly includes the Wakaligas in the backward caste category for reservations, but not the Lingayats, in order to split Lingayats and Wakaligas. Um, these things, plus other progressive programs, free housing for poorer people, uh, a drive against uh, moneylenders, um, these things made a significant difference. I should, uh, I should say, just stop at this point. 
and say that although De La Rosa is mainly remembered for his progressive redistributive pro-poor policies, he also did something rather different that made a huge difference in the long run for this state. He welcomed the creation of private engineering colleges in Karnataka. And many of those colleges produced the, the young graduates who later became crucial uh, foot soldiers in the development of the IT sector and the outsourcing sector in this state, and in, especially in Greater Bangalore. So that he, he prepared some of the ground for the IT boom which came later, even though no one could foresee the IT boom in his lifetime. Um, Dave Rogers also uh, helped to form caste associations for disadvantaged groups in the state. Small, some of the small groups that we, we think of as today as OBC groups. Uh, these groups had no associations, and for the first time he helped to uh, form associations for them so they could organize themselves and become a more a forceful, uh, give more forceful support for his party. What I'm saying is that this, this may seem rather tedious politics, that, you know, the, uh, undignified politics or something, but in fact what I'm talking about is a man who was a master of the political chess game. And you need to be that if you want to get things done. Um, 